Portanto, hoje vamos começar verdadeiramente a apresentar os temas centrais de controle por computador. E eu queria dedicar a aula de hoje a um exemplo uh, muito simples, mas que tem muitos elementos importantes e que é importante perceber bem, porque nos abre as portas a uh, uma série de conceitos. Às vezes, no, ao longo do vosso curso, estudaram uma série de, de conceitos muito sofisticados e muito poderosos e também muito, muito gerais, que se aplicam a uma grande variedade de situações. Mas às vezes a matemática tende a escurecer e a ofuscar a simplicidade das coisas que estão por trás dela. Então eu queria tratar aqui um problema de controle muito simples uh, e, e pensarmos um bocadinho qual é a relação que esse problema tem com as coisas que estudámos antes e, e, e com, também com o que vamos estudar a seguir. Portanto, eu lembro que nós vamos começar por falar sobre a estrutura de um sistema de controle por computador. Este, este é o primeiro capítulo, que vai ser um capítulo relativamente curto e que prepara, como eu disse, há três elementos muito importantes, que é perceber os modelos, que vai ser objeto do capítulo 2, perceber como é que eu posso estimar parâmetros nos modelos e qual é a estrutura dos modelos, portanto, a ordem dos sistemas, para usar uma linguagem com a qual já estão familiarizados. E depois o outro grande bloco será o projeto de controladores. Portanto, o vosso primeiro teste engloba os três primeiros capítulos e o segundo teste engloba o último capítulo. Reparem que uh, o facto de serem três capítulos na primeira parte e um na segunda é ilusório porque uh, a matéria acaba por ser relativamente uh, equilibrada porque uh, o capítulo 1 um vai ser, como eu disse, muito curtinho e, e depois o capítulo 2 é um pouco mais longo e o capítulo 3 um bocadinho mais longo. Portanto, o capítulo 4 equivale a estes três. Então vamos começar uma situação, vamos considerar uma situação muito simples. Uh, não sei se alguma vez tiveram a oportunidade de fazer isto. Um robô, considerar um robô da Lego. Basicamente é um carrinho, tem umas rodas e tem um sensor de distância. E eu tenho um alvo, tenho aqui um alvo que é este risco vertical, está aqui esquematizado, o carrinho está aqui à esquerda e o, o carrinho emite um ultrassom, o tempo que o impulso de ultrações demora a ir até o alvo e a ser refletido, é usado para calcular a distância. Portanto, eu tenho uma estimativa da distância. Tenho aqui, um, distância de, tenho aqui um, um sensor. E uh, aquilo que eu quero é projetar um controlador, quero projetar um controlador que me uh, leve o carrinho a uma certa distância R do meu alvo. Vamos... Alguma pergunta? Estão um rapaz nos comentários a pedir para serem coisas. Desculpa? Estão um rapaz no. Não é nos comentários, é na caixinha de algo aqui para serem coisas. Ok, vamos lá ver se eu encontro a caixinha. É no chat, professor. É no chat. Ora, onde é que ela está? É. Aqui no Morna. Morchat, ok. Okay, so Alex, uh, when I ask whether you don't understand, I, I, I noticed that you were here since the beginning, but I asked whether I could speak in Portuguese and you said nothing. So uh, please answer me. Okay, I will speak in English from now on. Okay. Thank you. Where do you come from, Alex? Uh, Sweden. Sweden, okay. Are you in Sweden or in Portugal? I'm here in Portugal. Okay, so are you having a good time? Yeah, awesome. Okay. Don't don't go to Bairro Alto because you can get uh, infected, huh? <laughs> Stay at home, yeah. like a, okay. a monk, okay? You have to live like a monk here. Ah, a Portuguese monk, okay. Okay, a Portuguese okay. monk. That's a, that's a good uh, comment. <laughs> okay, so I will speak in English now. Nice to, nice to hear from you, Alex. So, 
uh, my, my situation is I have a mobile robot that moves in just along a line and I can measure the distance to a target. Okay, and I'm assuming that the target is, is at a fixed position. So you can generalize this to a moving position. Maybe we can discuss this later. And I want to move the, the, the car. I want to design a controller that moves the car to a uh, dis distance r of the target, so this red line, okay? So the black line is the result given by the sensor, the position sensor, and uh, the red line is the so-called reference, what we call the reference. So, you know from, from a, a basic course on, you know from a basic course on, on uh, feedback control, that you can easily solve this problem with a feedback controller. Okay, so you have your system, and let's have some at least some qualitative idea of what is the the behavior of the system. So you can split it uh, in two parts. You have the motor and uh, the gearbox, the caixa de velocidade and you apply some um, you apply some excitation to the motor okay and the motor starts moving starts turning it forces the 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 car to move and uh, there are some disturbances perturbations there is there is a a t missing here okay there are some perturbations these perturbations are related to irregularities of the past. So you have, you can have small stones or some obstacles, and this causes some forces that uh, uh, delay or accelerate the vehicle. So uh, you have, as manipulated variable, the command to the motor u, and as output the velocity. And uh, actually, you could start writing, you have a moving mass, so you can apply Newton's law. But actually, the, the motor is in itself a controlled system, so you are actually imposing uh, a command, you actually commands the velocity. So there is a proportional relationship between U and V in the Lego next robot. Okay. Now you have another another part. This is a physical thing, and now you have something which is a mathematical relation, which is also physical, which is the relation between the velocity and the distance distance traveled by the car. And you know that this is a kind of integral. Okay, but we let's assume we, we know nothing about integrals. This is actually a mathematical relationship. Now, we have the sensor, and the sensor, what does it do? It measures the distance and gives you some signal that you can um, send to your computer. So your computer is in blue, okay? And inside the, inside the blue square, we have some software programmed in, inside the computer. So, uh, what does the software does? Uh, you know the desired distance, R. You can give it using the keyboard of the computer. And uh, you, at each time instant, you have the measure of the distance, okay? And then you do a subtraction, you build an error, a tracking error, the difference between R and D. And you amplify it with some gain, and in this way you generate the command to the motor. So there is here a hardware block associated to the output uh, port of the of the computer. Okay. Of course, there are some uh, uh, DA converter, some AD converter, and so on. But this is let's let's assume we think that these blocks have gain one. Okay, so this is uh, a typical feedback controller. 
How does it work? How does it work? Sorry. How does it work? So, suppose that uh, you, you do these plots to do a qualitative analysis. Now, you are initially, this is time, and you are initially at some position, okay? More or less where the initial point of this blue line is, which is far away from the reference. So you have some error. Your error is positive because it's R minus D. And since U is proportional to the error, you have a positive excitation for the motor. So the vehicle starts moving in such a way that D goes in the positive direction. So the error is being reduced, okay? And since error is being, uh, the error is being reduced, your excitation to the motor is al also being reduced. And there is a point in which you reach your reference. So the error is zero and the excitation of the motor is zero and hopefully the car stops there. Now, if you change your reference, if you change your reference, then again, you have now a negative error because the reference is smaller than the position. Okay, so you have a negative error. You have a negative excitation to the motor. That This means that the motor will move in the opposite direction. And, but essentially something happens like this, okay? Now, this is wishful thinking. Isto é o nosso desejo, okay? Does it work like this? We, we need probably to do some deeper analysis to, to see whether this works. You know that not all controllers, not all control systems work. I mean, if he, that would be the case, there won't be any need for control engineers. It would be a, a threat to uh, the profession that you are studying to. Okay. Now, when we think of a control system, what is important to look at? Can you, can you tell me? Important things to look, important features that you want to ensure uh, when looking at uh, the design of a control system. Robustez. Robustez. What is robustness? What is robustness? You, you, can, you, can, you can say uh, things in, in English and then I will translate to the English students that are attending the class. So what do you mean by robustness? Uh, é não, não ter muitas oscilações. Uh, I, you are saying that this is not to oscillate too much. Well, it's not my notion of robustness. I mean, if, if you ask your, does your mother is an engineer? What is your first name? Well, Inês. Inês? Okay. What is the, 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 is your mother an engineer? No. No, no. Okay. <laughs> So she knows nothing about control, no. nor engineering. Robustness is a, an important concept in engineering, but she knows, your mother knows the word robustness. So what is the meaning that you think that your mother gives to robustness? Uh, For instance, a glass, a glass object is robust? No. No? Uh, if you eat, suppose that you have two, two, uh, two objects, one of glass and another made of iron, okay? Yes. Suppose that you have two, two glasses, two, 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 two bars, two jars, two jarras, uma de vidro e uma de metal, e uma de aço inoxidável. Uh, you, you ask your mother which one is the more robust. What would uh, she said? She said the iron. The iron one for sure because it does not break if you hit it. Okay, if you pick up a stick and uh, you hit the glass jar, it will break. 
okay? But what is the concept of robustness in engineering? Who knows? Who helps in it? Uh, I think I know. It's okay. Okay. not having, not reagir bem às perturbações. It's more general than that, okay? It's more general than that, okay? The, 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 the robustness is something which is common to all engineering design. E electrical engineering, civil engineering, chemical engineering, and so on, okay? So, uh, the central concept of robustness is this. When you do a design, you do a design for some nominal system, for uh, you say, well, I have a system that has these characteristics, and you do the design for that, okay? And the design is robust if it works, even when the characteristics are not exactly the one, the ones that you thought they were, okay? So uh, you apply your uh, design, the design system, to the system that you, you want to control or to use, um, okay? And uh, uh, it is robust, e even if, even when there are errors in your nominal system with respect to reality, your design still works, perhaps, with some degradation of performance, okay? Let me give you, let me tell you a story. This story happened when I, when I was 10, I was going very much to, a lot to Setubal, to the beach. Troia was a wonderful place. Nothing like, compared to what is now. And uh, so I was hearing a, a lot of stories about Setubal. And there was a big scandal because uh, six balconies fell in a building in Setubal. They built the new building and uh, six balconies fell down. And construíram o edifício em Setúbal e seis varandas caíram. Okay? Uh, the, the one of the sixth floor fell down and uh, all the others went down. So what was the problem? The building was uh, designed, the structure of the building was designed by an engineer who had not much experience. Okay. He was a new engineer, a young engineer, and he had not much experience. So he tried to um, make the design using materials that could save in iron. Okay? So he was uh, using a, a type of steel that was very efficient in having very strong structures. But if you do some mistake in uh, building the structure of the building, for instance, if you were not placing the iron uh, rods in the correct positions, or if you were uh, placing a little less iron than usual, it was quite sensitive, okay? Instead, with the classical designs, you were using other types of steel that uh, were not as efficient, so you were spending a lot more money to buy the steel, but uh, they were less sensitive, the, the resulting structures were less sensitive to variations to what was the real design. So what happened was that the, the guy who built the, the constructor, the, the guy who built the, the building, uh, actually did not follow exactly the design, and this caused the accident, okay? So, robustness has to do with uh, a lot of sensitivity, okay? So, robustness is, I will say in English and then in Portuguese, when a, uh, a design is robust, if the design system still attains its objectives, perhaps with some degradation, even when there are errors in the model for which it was designed. I will tell now this in Portuguese. Um projeto é robusto uh, se 
tolera pequenos erros ou alguns erros em relação ao modelo para o qual foi projetado. Portanto, se eu, eu projetei um sistema com determinado modelo, se o modelo tem sempre erros, quanto maiores foram os erros que permitem que o meu sistema continue a funcionar, então eu digo que maior é a robustez, ok? Não, robustness has to do with sensitivity, and it's certainly an important feature here, but does not have exactly to do with oscillation. So, one important thing, robustness. Other things, there are perhaps two more, two more basic things in, in uh, relation to control design, yes? Stability? Stability, the system must be stable. Yes. Because if it is not stable, it will not converge to the the value that we want. It will it will not converge because it will diverge. That's right. Yes. Very good. Stability. And there is still one thing which is the most basic, basic, basic things. You design a controller for what? What was the purpose of the controller? In this in this case, in this, in this particular case. To stay at an hour distance from the wall. Okay, and this in general is what? What you, what you call uh, in this it's case? The target. It's the target. It's the performance of the system, the target performance. Okay, so uh, you must look at performance. Does D approaches R? Okay, now you must look at stability and you also must look at robustness. Okay. So, uh, we need to study these things, we need to use models and mathematical analysis, okay? Uh, okay, so let's move on to mathematical analysis. How can I build a model for this car? It moves along a line. And uh, remember that I told you that uh, the position, the sorry, the velocity is proportional to the excitation of the motor. Okay, this means that the the uh, system is itself controlled. The motor is its, its, as itself an inner controller which is not shown. Okay, otherwise we we would need uh, Newton's law, but to design or to build a model in this type of things that move, what do we need? There is something which is very basic that we need. If you want to study a moving thing, a moving target, how do you characterize motion? What do you need to characterize motion? The velocity? Sorry? Position and velocity. Position and velocity, that's good. But uh, to express position, what do you need in a, in a mechanical system? Uh, referential. A referential, so we need a referential. So what is our referential here? What type of referential do we have? Very simple uh, one. Yeah, yes. x, y. Uh, just a, a straight line, okay? Yeah. So we have just a straight line. Okay, uh, I jumped over uh, a slide, but this, I'm going to say what is in the slide. So, okay, let's put the slide. Uh, so, we need a referential, and the referential is somewhat arbitrary. So, the zero of the referential, even the direction. Okay, now there is one, the very first important concept everybody should understand what i'm going to say now we use the concept of uh, discrete time you see the yellow label discrete time what is discrete time i'm going to break the time in strips 0 h 2h 3h etc where h is the so called uh, sampling interval it's the interval from uh, between which we don't look at the system. So you are going to look 
at the, at the value of variables of the system only at times 0, h, 2h, 3h, and so on. Okay? And this is this n that multiplies h is what I call discrete time. Is this understand? Understandable? Okay. So to study the system, we have the referential, which is this vertical line, this vertical line, okay, which is aligned with the position of the motor. And I have some zero and uh, the position of the, of the robot is a point in this line. So I have, I had a, an extra uh, straight line, which is time. And I marked here the sampling instance, zero, H, two H, three H and so on, okay? And uh, I start at some initial, po initial position, okay? And then of course the, the robot moves continuously. So I have a continuous, plot of the, that uh, tells you the position of the robot at a given time, even in between the sampling instance. But I'm going to just be concerned of what happens between the sampling instance. Okay. Now, I want to pick up two consecutive sampling instance, say, n h and n minus one h where n is discrete time a generic discrete time and i want to relate these two positions and it's very simple because the next position is the previous position times the velocity okay time uh, plus the velocity times the the sampling time so uh, if you are here at this point at the consecutive point, you are in a position which is the previous position plus what you traveled. And you traveled velocity times the sampling interval h. Okay? And I'm assuming that the velocity is proportional to this command to the, to the motor, alpha u. So the velocity is not exactly u. u, I'm going to normalize it between 0 and 100%. And uh, alpha u is the velocity. Okay. So how can I find alpha? That's one. It's a parameter that enters the system. So I can say suppose that uh, I observe that when I apply one hundred percent of excitation to the motor, the car moves at one meter per second. So one meter per second is 100% times alpha, so alpha is 0 0.01. Actually, this is faster than, than a, a Lego robot. Okay, this, is, this example is, you see, it's an a homage to Alex, uh, comes from Sweden, okay? The big inventors of Lego. Uh, so this is faster, but it's just an example. So you just make an experiment in which you apply some excitation to the motor between zero and 100, say 100 or 50, 100% uh, or 50% or whatever, and you measure the velocity, and then you use this equation. You know that uh, u times alpha equals to the velocity. So now you go the other way, so you compute alpha from this. Is this understood? Okay. This is a very simple example of identifying the system, finding this parameter. Okay. Usually, it's much more complicated. In this case, we do this sim simple reason. Okay. Now, uh, I have the model of the movement of robot. Does everybody agrees that this uh, represents the movement of the robot? I'll gain que não tenha percebido que a primeira linha traduz o um movimento do robô, ou todos perceberam? Se alguém não percebeu, diga que não percebeu, não tenha vergonha. Hein? Ok. 
No. I can, I want to understand, to analyze what happens to my control system. So this is the model of the open loop system. Now to build the model of the control system with a controller to couple to the system, uh, what I'm going to do is to use the equations that is defined as the controller. So uh, my error is equal to the reference minus the position. Okay. And the motor command is nothing more than amplifying the error with some gain k. So I pick up these three equations. So I replace u by ke and d by r minus x, and you get this equation, which is the model of the control system or the closed loop system. On the top, you have the model of the open loop system, the uncontrolled system. Or at the bottom, you have the model of the controlled system or the closed loop system. Em cima temos o modelo do sistema em cadeia aberta, que queremos controlar. E em baixo temos o modelo do sistema controlado ou sistema em cadeia fechada. Ok? Is this understand? Uh, understood? It sounds, my, my voice is a little bit uh, frightened. A minha voz é um pouco ameaçadora, mas desculpem lá, isto. Eu tento ser claro e ao ser muito claro sai este tom assim horrível, parece que eu tenho um pau na mão, vou bater em quem disser que não percebe, mas a ideia não é essa. Está bem? A ideia é que percebam, e estes conceitos são muito, muito importantes. Muitas das dificuldades às vezes vêm porque nós não sabemos bem os conceitos fundamentais. Portanto, nunca tenham vergonha de dizer que não percebem alguma coisa. Alguém quer perguntar algo até agora? Ok. Let's move on. You, you can always ask afterwards. And we go back. Okay. Now, remember, we had these three things. Performance, stability, and robustness. Uh, can I use this slide to study immediately, to give some conclusion on one of these three things. Posso usar este slide para tirar alguma conclusão imediatamente sobre algumas destas três coisas, sobre uh, desempenho, estabilidade e robustez. What about, what about uh, performance? Remember, performance here is the capacity of uh, staying close to R. What happens when you attain R? What does this, the last equation tells you? What happens if you are, yes, yes? Technically it will stop because the, the force will be zero. The force applied will be zero uh, because the distance is Was zero. there any force in my theory? Do you see any force? Uh, no. Uh, you mean you, the excitation to the motor, okay. Yes. But uh, uh, you don't see you in the last equation. What do you see? What happens when x equal to r? Diogo. Diogo, well, it's Diogo who's speaking, no? Yes, yes. Well, only the x uh, will be if, in the equation. If x is equal to r, what happens? The, the, car, will be zero. the car stops. Then, then this is zero. And why why do you say it stops? Look because, at the equation. Because x e equals the previous position. Okay, x at n plus one is equal to the x of n. So x becomes constant. Okay? So if x is equal to r, this is zero. Okay, this is zero, and the position remains constant and it remains constant at x equal to r, okay? So x equal to r is an equilibrium point, which is a good thing for performance, okay? The desired position is an equilibrium point. An equilibrium point is something that if you start there, you stay there, <clears throat> okay? 
you have to uh, start using the equations and look at the equ equations tell you something. Okay, let's move on. Now, this is a, an example of uh, this is an example of uh, difference equation. You you are probably more familiar with differential equations than with difference equation. A, a, a difference equation is, uh, you, suppose that you have a sequence of numbers, a difference equation is uh, something that relates the values of the sequences at different indexes. So I'm relating x at n plus one, I'm forgetting the h because everything is indexed by h. So I'm relating x at n plus one with the previous x, okay? Actually, it also appears here, so I can rewrite it in this way, you see? I can rewrite it in this way. Okay? So, let, let's give numbers. Suppose that alpha is 0 0.01, h is 1, k is 60. Uh, so, you can compute 1 minus alpha kh, which is 0.4. Okay? So, this difference equation tells you how to compute x at n plus one, I've, I'm omitting the h, actually it's one, as a function of the previous one and the, as a function of r, okay? So you start with an initial condition, x zero, and then you compute x one from x zero, you make n equal to zero, so x one is equal to 0.4 x zero plus 0.6 r, then you compute x2 from x1 and so on. You go on iterating the thing. Okay? Have you ever studied difference equations previously in the course? Yes, no. we have. Okay, so, so you, you are familiar with this concept. Okay, so uh, this, this is a small example. You can do this with MATLAB or you don't do it by hand. I mean, only very simple examples. Now, one important thing is the notion of equilibrium points. An equilibrium point is a value of x such that uh, if you start at that value, x remains at that value. So xn plus one must be equal to xn, okay? If this happens, and uh, it happens because you started at some value, given value x bar, then x bar is said to be an equilibrium point, okay? The fact that you have an equilibrium does not mean that you are stable, okay? I imagine that you have um, a mountain, okay? A very, very regular mountain, and you are exactly at the top of the mountain, okay? The top of the mountain is, an equilibrium point. You can put there a round ball and it stays there. But if you deviate it a little bit, it, the ball moves away. So it's an unstable equilibrium. Now, if you have a valley, okay, again, if you place your ball on the lowest position of the valley, it stays there. Again, you have an equilibrium. Now, if you move the ball, the ball, the ball will return to your equilibrium. It's a, actually more than stable, it's asymptotically stable. Okay? So don't, don't confuse equilibrium points with stable stability. They are different concepts. Now, how can I compute the equilibrium point, for instance, for this equation? So I just equate xn plus 1 to xn. I put a x bar and I solve this equation. This is a linear equation. It works also for uh, nonlinear systems. This is a general concept. And in this case, x bar, the equilibrium point is just r. That's nice, okay? Now, stability. Stability means that, well, let's use a heuristic heuristic uh, idea. Stability means that if you, if you uh, deviate a little bit, 
then you don't go away from the equilibrium. So uh, I need to have a model, not for x, but for the deviation of x with respect to the reference. And um, so I pick up the original equation. This is the equation that we have used. And I'm going to, to use a trick, which is multiply everything by minus one. So you get minus x of n plus one equals to minus xn minus alpha kr, kh times r minus xn. Then I add r in both sides. So r here and r here, r on the left, r on the right. Okay, so this equation is equivalent to that. Now it's very easy to express everything in terms of the error. The error is the difference between r and xn. So here, here, you have e of nh. Here you have e of nh. And here you have e of n plus 1h. Okay, so you, you get this equation for e. And you can rewrite it by uh, grouping these two terms because they both depend on e of nh, e of nh. So you write it like this. Okay? So uh, this is the algebra. Much more important is the conclusions that you take from this equation. So E is uh, the error of the position with respect to the reference. Can you say something about the fact that E goes to zero or E does not go to zero? I need your help now. Um, we know that um, E um, on n plus one h is always less than uh, on, on the previous time. Are you because sure? Because k is positive. If k is positive, uh, suppose that k is positive, but very large, so that one minus k h a alpha is, for instance, 10, 10, uh, minus 10, sorry. So k is very large. So if k is very large, this becomes negative and much bigger than one. Suppose that it's minus 10. Uh, maybe kh uh, alpha should be uh, between zero and one. kh alpha, is this, is this the condition? I don't know, maybe. <laughs> Other opinions? That's very good. You, you, were, you were saying things. We are thinking together. Okay, the ones that don't speak are the ones that uh, are doing wrong. So, uh, your, what is your first name? Uh, Eduardo. Eduardo. So, Eduardo is saying uh, the condition is that kh alpha must be between zero and one. Why so, Eduardo? Can you elaborate a little bit? Um, I would say that because if kh alpha is between zero and one, uh, the error um, is always getting lower uh, in each in each uh, in each time. If okay, I'm... that's true. This is true because one minus something between zero and one is always between zero and one, and uh, so e is decreasing. Uh, can you can you be a little bit more general than that? Suppose that you have e of let's forget about here this this h here. We know it's present, so I will I won't mention it. Suppose that we have e of n plus one is equal to beta e of n. So what is the condition on beta? Uh, if beta if if the module of beta uh, okay. is less than one. Oh, okay. So beta should be between what and what? Be between minus one and one. Minus one and one. Now, here you have something which is quite similar. What is your beta here? Uh, one minus kh alpha. So the condition is that one minus kh alpha should be what? 
uh, between minus one and one. Good, Eduardo. Okay. So uh, the point is that actually you can solve this equation. It's the initial. It's a it's a, a power system. It's a kind of exponential function. Okay, the power function. So uh, the basis of the power function must be between minus one and one, so that e of n goes to zero. Okay, and uh, the condition is that one minus kh alpha must be smaller than one. And you, if you solve this equation, actually, uh, you need two or three lines of algebra, and you come to the conclusion that k must be positive and smaller than two divided by h alpha, okay? And this is the stability condition because e goes to zero, you see? Now, uh, I also wrote here, if k is between zero and one divided by h alpha, there are no oscillations. What a funny thing, this is a first order system. You only have one delay but you can have oscillations. Where does these oscillations come from? Overshooting. 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 So, but mathematically, what uh, the oscillations mean that E, instead of decreasing monotonously or increasing, if E starts by being negative, uh, you have uh, e, an E which is positive and negative and positive and negative. In modulus, it's decreasing because it's stable. You are, you are satisfying the stability condition. But is, is there a situation in which E, the sign of E can be alternating? What is the condition? Or if you want, what is the condition so that there are no oscillations, no change in sign of E? Suppose that one minus k h alpha is one half. Okay, is there any change of sign in e? You are always multiplying by one half. Do you change the sign of e? No, no, because you are multiplying by a positive number. So uh, give me an example in which, for the value that I place here, such that the sign of e is. Uh, is is changing if it is K negative H alpha minus one alpha be okay okay that's right so if it's negative if this is negative and uh, verifying always this condition then then there are some oscillations okay um and if you impose this extra condition you get that k is further not to have oscillation k is further constrained to this value okay actually if you do the experiments with the with the car you you verify this condition this, uh, this is a very good theory okay so now let me ask you another thing let me ask you another thing uh, you studied you had a system signal and system theory studied you studied control but in particular uh, you study discrete time uh, systems and uh, and the discrete uh, difference equations in signals and systems. So uh, if I I give you some the equation of some system and I ask you about stability, what is the 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 tool that you are picking up from what you know? What is the tool to study the stability of, of a linear system? Because this is a linear system, okay? This is a linear system. What is the, the tool that you would uh, pick up? The chapter of the book on signals and systems. You, were, you studied by the book by Wilski, wasn't it? So you, where would you look for things about stability? There is one buzzword.
Stability in linear systems, what is the general criteria for stability of linear systems that all electrical engineers know about? Uh, eigenvalues within the unit disk. Eigenvalues uh, or poles. Poles. Okay. If you have a transfer function, and then you look at the poles of the transfer function, and the poles must be within the unit disk in the complex domain. Was it? No. Uh, I could come to very powerful con conditions on stability and even conditions on oscillation on the response being or not being oscillatory. Did I spoke about uh, transfer function? No. Did I spoke about poles? No. Uh, is it bounded input so bounded output or you tell me i mean uh, uh, that's, that's, when you, that's, that's, a, that's when that's you that's another concept bounded input bounded output so this is for a, a, this concept is for let's write let's go back to this this slide uh, this is another concept that is applied for systems with an input and an output, okay? And uh, so is this, uh, what is the concept of stability? My concept was that the error goes to zero, but now you say uh, bounded input and bounded output, Bibble stability. A system is Bibble stability. If you have a bounded uh, input, then the output stays bounded. So what is the input here of the control? I'm speaking about the control system. What is the, the input? input is, the, is the U signal, right? Or the, no, it's, uh, for the control system is the reference. The reference. Let's, let's go, let's, that's very important. Let's go here. You see, for the control system, the input is the reference and the output is the, is the distance, okay? For the uh, open loop system, the input is U and the output is D. Okay. Now, uh, is the uncontrolled system, so the open loop system, is it Bibble stable? If you apply, for instance, a constant excitation in the motor, what happens to the position? Thinking, think in terms of heuristically, you apply a constant u. Constant u means constant velocity. What happens to the distance when you have a constant velocity? It'll be linear because it it grows without bound. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, the open loop system is. Bibble stable or not Bibble stable? Not. <laughs> not Bibble it stable not, because yeah. you can find uh, a bounded input for which the output is not bounded. So it's not Bibble stable. Now you close the loop. You close the loop. Okay? So the input now is R and the output is D. Is it Bibble stable or not? And suppose that you are. Uh, you are uh, constraining k to have a value such that the tracking error e goes to zero. If, okay? if, e, if e goes to zero, then it, it will uh, get to a point uh, where it should be bounded, or I think. So you have to be careful because uh, we have just shown that d goes to r. But then you have the transient. But the transient is always decreasing. So you could prove that it's Bebo stable. So the open loop system is not Bebo stable, but the closed loop system is Bebo stable. Okay. Actually, actually, Bebo stability is a twin concept of stability in the sense that I said about the uh, poles being inside the unit circle for linear systems. Okay. 
for linear systems, the concepts are not exactly equivalent, but they are, uh, if you have stability in my sense, it will be Bibo stable for a linear system, okay? Uh, so you can check the poles. More questions? More questions. So my propose in this example was, actually we have, uh, we followed an engineering procedure. In general, models are much more complicated and you need computers to do the computations and so on. In this example, you can do everything by hand, okay? In a practical situation, you can't, but if in this case it's a practical situation, I mean, you can build the, the system, but of course, usually things are uh, in the, the problems with which you are going to be confronted in your professional life will be much more complicated. So uh, you have to more complicated uh, models and you have to do more complicated designs and you cannot uh, rely on just this mathematics, elementary mathematics. Okay. Now, one thing that I want to call you is, uh, what is the relation of my analysis with the story of poles and zero, of poles? So you have learned, you have studied that uh, the poles for a system, for a linear system to be stable, the poles have, or asymptotically stable, the poles have to be inside unit circle. So, uh, what is the relationship of my analysis with, with the poles, with the story of poles? Is there, uh, is, are there poles here somewhere? If you apply the Z-transform, if you apply uh, the Z-transform, what is the pole? If you apply the Z-transform, what you get here? Okay, Let, let's look at, uh, okay, for the, for the, the, here you don't have a transfer function, but uh, if you, if you solve this by the, the Z-transform, what you get? you get uh, the Z-transform Z times the Z-transform of V is equal to one minus K H alpha times the Z-transform of E of N, okay? So uh, if you solve it, if you add some initial condition and if you solve it with respect to E, you get, this, this will be the pole. The pole is one minus K H alpha. So this condition is actually that the pole is inside the unit circle, you see? The big trick, the big trick is that in this case, we could, we could um, solve these problems without speaking about poles, transfer functions, uh, Z-transform, you see? Things that you take a lot of time to study, several weeks to study at least, perhaps months to study, but we could do it, okay? Uh, there is one. Uh, there is one. One physicist. He was a Nobel Prize, and he was a, a very funny person. And uh, called uh, Richard Feynman. And uh, he told the story that when he was very young, he, he was in a residence for students, and they had a kind of uh, curved rule to, to to plot curves. Okay. Uh, and uh, this uh, had a number of holes and you have different curves and uh, you can use it to to draw curves always of course with the shapes of the of the ruler and uh, one day he said he he, he, he was with his uh, mates at the residence and he said uh, do you know about some property verified by these curves. And everybody started looking at him and he said, well, uh, if you pick up a pencil and you put the pencil as an axis and you hang 
and if you hang the curve, the the ruler uh, from the pencil, the pencil will uh, the curve is such that the at the lowest position the tangent will be horizontal. Okay. Now uh, everybody started making experiments and they came to that conclusion that he was saying something which was true, and they thought it was a big finding. But then he said, well, uh, actually, we know that any uh, differentiable curve uh, has a zero uh, derivative at a minimum. So the tangent will be always horizontal at a minimum. OK? Which was what they were essentially doing. So uh, he was saying, well, these guys did not knew what they knew. Eles não sabiam o que sabiam. Now, perhaps one of the most important things of this lecture is to call it your attention to this fact. You know a lot of things, a lot of mathematics now you have been studying for uh, more than three years, three and a half years, three years at least. And you studied a lot of sophisticated things and you know a lot of sophisticated things. Okay, now. Uh, what is really important is that you try to know how to use these things, okay? So uh, don't use the things like having boxes and uh, you, I have one problem and uh, this is problem number eight and problem number eight goes with solution uh, of the letter D, okay? Things do not work like that. You have to learn how to relate how to use your tools, okay? So your mathematical knowledge is a kind of toolbox. And uh, sometimes uh, if you use your good sense with your uh, sophisticated mathematical skills, because you have them with a little bit of freedom, you are able to solve problems. So this problem could be solved by uh, a student of the first year. Okay. Nevertheless, we could prove conditions on performance and stability, and even on robustness, because you say, if k is between this range, it's stable. So actually, you are, giving, you are given some, this is equivalent to some robustness conditions, to some insensitivity condition for stability. Okay, and we did this essentially using very basic arguments. Okay, so this is a philosophical part. Okay, let's move on. Uh, I would like now to speak in uh, a little bit more terms for more 10 minutes and then we go. And uh, so what we have, we have a system, which is a continuous time system, which is related, which is connected to a computer by a DA and an AD, okay? And uh, so between the input of the DA and the output of the AD, uh, you have a discrete time system, in discrete time, okay? So you can, you are looking at some precise instance of time called the sampling instance, and that are separated by an interval of time, which is the sampling interval. So uh, your controller is something that picks up the values read from the AD, does some computations, and computes the U to the uh, to put at the DA. Okay. Now, uh, how can we do this? Usually, usually, uh, you use a scheme based on interruptions in a microcomputer. I want, I want, if you, you can read this slide if you want. Uh, some of you have studied um, electronics and they, they have studied, studied the AD conversion. One thing which is important is that converting an analog tension to a numerical, uh, to a numerical value takes some time. It's very fast, but it takes some time. And if you are, um, if you if you have uh, uh, 
if you have a very fast system with very small sampling intervals, this conversion time is important. It appears as a delay in your system, in your control system, which can affect stability. Now, one other, another important thing to bear in mind is that you have what we call a watch. A watch is something that produces a square wave, and then at the rising edges, for instance, okay, you do the readings. And this synchronizes the input and the output list of numbers. Okay, so what is the basic software structure for computer control? So you have a main program that basically does nothing in, apart from being in a loop. And when uh, the reading of a number is ready from the DA, so remember that the, this clock is telling you every second or every millisecond when it happens, uh, you jump to a routine. Usually you do this with uh, interruption scheme an interrupt scheme so you, you jump to an interrupt uh, subroutine in which you inhibit further interruptions or just to be sure you read the input port connected to the ad the input port of the computer connected to the ad you compute the value of you you write it at the port uh, connected to the DA, then you restore interruptions and you return to the main program. Okay? And our course is about this line here. Okay? But this is the structure. Right? So if you want to look at this in a, a time scale, in a time um, uh, plot, so you have your watch, which is just a square wave. Okay. The watch generates a square wave. And then at riding edges, every, say, every millisecond or every 10 milliseconds, whatever. If it is a glass furnace that you are controlling every two hours, okay? So we can use a uh, pendulum uh, clock to say tick, 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 bong. Okay? So what happens? So uh, it takes some time to read the output in the DAD. Then you compute your U and then you write it to the DA. And this reading and writing take thing, things of the, say, a typical industrial equipment takes about, say, 50 microseconds. Okay? So it's very, very small. And then you wait for another interruption. So uh, your manipulated variable had some time and there is a delay in the computation, okay? Now, if your computer is very fast, this, is, this delay in computation is very small. So uh, in many cases, you can uh, assume that this is neglectable. So when there comes a tick of the watch, you can say U of Tn is, updated, okay? But in some cases not. So you can take this into account and this appears as a pure delay of the system. And the pure delay is something that can affect stability. So bear this in mind when you have, say, uh, a robot arm that you want to control or something that can even be faster. Okay, this is what I was just saying. I wrote this just for memory. Now, uh, always bear in mind that you have, in general, a number of control objectives, disturbances. Uh, sorry, uh, you have to. The, the objective of a control system is to keep the output value or the state, sometimes it's the state of the system, close to a reference value, despite the occurrence of disturbances, okay? And you want to stabilize the plant. Perhaps you want to impose a specific dynamics. For instance, if you have an aircraft 
and you don't want to go to the reference uh, as fast as possible, but according to a smooth dynamics, okay? Without much oscillations and with some rising time. So you want to impose specific dynamics. And sometimes you also want to optimize the system, for instance, to minimize the energy consumption, okay? And we are going to, to say something about that. Uh, another important thing is that sometimes you want to keep a constant behavior despite plant changes. Okay? Plant can change for many, many aspects. If it is a biological plant changing all the time due to the complexity of the system. If it is a, an aircraft depending on the atmosphere, depending on the amount of fuel that it carries, which is being consumed, and so on. Okay, due to wearing of uh, the plant and so on. So this is the story of adaptive control, something that we are also going to study. Um, okay, we'll stop here. It, it has been a, a very dense uh, course, a very dense lecture. So we stop here and uh, uh, Next week, we will continue. Any question? Okay, if not, have a good weekend of work and uh, learn a lot. Bye bye. Uh, I have a, a yeah, thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thank you. Good, good weekend. Bye.